All right, hello. Welcome back. Chase Thomas Podcast, taping this on a Thursday morning. Locked on Falcons host, Aaron Freeman is here. Aaron, good morning. How are you? I'm doing good, Chase. Nice to be here talking uh, some Atlanta Falcons football with you. Oh, well, look, I've got the the new polo working. It's great weather up here in East Tennessee. Hardly home, but always repping, you know? Looks like uh, you're ready to go to Augusta in that shirt. Well, you, funny you say that. Masters this weekend, and I found out, like, it's a possibility next year. Like, I've gotten confirmation that uh, it is a possibility uh, to get to Augusta. Have you ever been to the Masters I, or no? I have never been. I have never been. Are you a golf guy? Not really. No? <laughs> but I, I have some friends that, that are, so, yeah. Okay. Well, when you're not watching tape and watching Falcons, what are you doing? What's your, because your, you're in North Carolina, right? Yeah, yeah. Are you a hiker? Um, no, I'm just grinding film all the, no, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, mm-hmm. What do I do? Uh, you know, I, I just try to stay away from football. So, like, mm. my Zen activity is just, like, cooking. You mm. know, I feel like stress, just get in the kitchen spend 30 45 minutes in the kitchen cook something up and then you know by then i'm i'm good to go there you go what's the best what's your best thing you can make i mean most people will tell you chicken wings but like you okay. know that, that doesn't feel like <laughs> a, strong, <laughs> uh, a strong uh recipe or whatever you just you know put some chicken in in, in some fat or something or an air fryer or something like that air fryers are clutch man yeah when we got in the air fryer game last year it was a it was a game changer my wife and i like the air fryer you can throw anything in that thing and it's it works out what, a, what an invention. Yeah, what an invention. Yeah, definitely. Well, we're, we could talk all things air fryers on this <laughs> podcast, but I think some folks would prefer us talking uh, some Atlanta Falcons, Aaron. And my first question for you, because I, I think there's just Falcons fans are cautiously optimistic about where things are headed. I don't know if you felt the same with uh, your listeners um, over on Lockdown Falcons, but I think everyone's just because they were so active because things looked pretty solid down the stretch because they have this identity because it feels like we're past the okay we got to get through cap hell and uh just you know we gotta we gotta get through it and we'll see what happens although i will say thomas dimitrov the way we rewrite history or some falcons fans are rewriting history with thomas dimitrov can't stand for it can't stand for uh maybe the best gm of uh our our lifetime here in atlanta and now it's just like oh because it ended that way it's like oh well look at the whole thomas dimitrov put us in it's like i can pull up an article from espn like bill barnwell for like four years ago it's like thomas dimitrov has assembled the best uh roster in the nfl it's like all right let's let's calm down like it didn't end well but whatever then you have the Bijan robinson conversation right and i'm seeing this more and more i think you're talking yourself into it a little bit tyler algier was awesome he looked like the reincarnation of michael turner is a bowling ball uh, behind this Falcons offensive line last year. Like, well, dude, workhorse kind of guy. It makes sense with Arthur Smith's scheme. Are you talk? Have you gotten to the point where you've talked yourself into the Falcons taking B. John Robinson at eight and it not being an absolute dumpster fire? (laughs) Well, you know, I, I've been early on the idea of the Falcons taking B. John Robinson at eight. You know, this is a regime that, prides itself on taking the best player available mm-hmm. and when you see Bijan robinson consistently ranked among pretty much universally in in various people's like top five players mm-hmm. in this draft class and you look at the other potential options that could be available for the falcons today it, it seems almost guaranteed that Bijan robinson if he's not going to be the top player uh, on the board he'll be very close to the top and so i think that's Really, when you have the conversation about whether or not the Falcons will take B. John Robinson, that's really it. It's really a testament to are they truly a best player available type of drafting organization or do they just say that thing as a way to sort of justify whoever they wind up picking? They say, oh, that guy was the best player available, which I think we we know NFL teams tend to be more of the latter mm-hmm. um, when it comes to that. And so with B. John Robinson, what's funny about that is – Back in early December, when a you know random person on Twitter asked me like, "Who do you think the Falcons going to pick?" and I was like, mm-hmm. oh, "Yeah, Bijan Robinson, like because they love to run the football and their running game is is very good, but like he would be kind of their Derrick Henry." And of course, you know that that got a lot of backlash on the internet, and um, you know, and understandably because 
right at that point, like Tyler Algier really took off and, and really finished the season strong. So it felt like it was not necessarily a, a major need, and especially given some of the other obvious, more obvious holes on the team at the time. Uh, and now I think the Falcons have successfully kind of filled a lot of those issues and addressed a lot of those issues. And if they haven't, then they can still have opportunities to get those later in the draft. And so now it, it's the last couple of months have been more so <laughs> me trying to convince the world that that initial take mm. on hey, they could take B. John Robinson um, was not as crazy an idea. And like slowly and surely, I've, I've watched Falcon fans that were initially very skeptical of that idea of, the, of them taking B. John Robinson uh, sort of slowly adopt this idea. And, you know, I've enjoyed the sort of status. This is to me what it feels like to be a cult leader to a certain <laughs> extent where mm-hmm. you just like, OK, you, you say a thing and then people are like, no, that's crazy. And then you slowly and surely they get indoctrinated into the cult. And so while I, I am a big fan of B. John Robinson a, as a player, um, I don't necessarily think the Falcons will take him, but mm-hmm. to me, it feels like they could take him if that whole best player available thing that they talk about constantly is a reality as opposed to just a sort of statement that they say in order to justify whoever they wind up taking. Why not just trade for Derrick Henry at the midpoint? Like the do the Christian McCaffrey trade from last year, obviously not the same kind of value and you're not giving up the same kind of picks to Tennessee in that kind of way, but if he looks okay, Tennessee, I think, is going to be awful. Like, I think we're nearing, like, just with the amount of production they just lost, I think this is it for Ryan Tannehill. Um, they might go quarterback in round one this year. I just think the rebuild is on in Tennessee, whether they want it to be the case or not. This is now Jacksonville's division. And I just, you already have the familiarity. You have Tyler Elgier in the building. But if it's, like, a third-round pick or something, if it's something not all that great and they're just doing Derrick Henry a solid for these la- the last year, year and a half of him being – an elite running back in the NFL, why not just go that route and then go like a Joey Porter Jr. or Christian Gonzalez, who I would love if he's there at eight. I just, I can't get around the corner. I can't get around. Like, I would even rather go receiver than running back, like Jackson Smith and Jigba, which went crazy on my uh, on the Twitter feed because I had ESPN NFL draft analyst Matt Miller on and Falcons fans were just like apoplectic about JSN because like they didn't use the slot last year so why would you go Jason I'm like I think they might adjust if they like if you're gonna draft somebody like JSN I think uh, Arthur Smith is flexible enough to be like all right maybe we should use a slot guy maybe it was partly because the Falcons had let me check my notes here uh one receiver they could count on all last year like I understand part of it is like their identity but I, I think there is more nuance into what personnel groupings are going to be and just doing what's available what like with the guys you have um and the guys they had out wide was not great as you and i <laughs> know uh last year but i don't know like does that make sense for you could you see that also being a possibility and would you be well, okay with it a wide receiver no derrick henry oh derrick henry um i mean it, I, I get it why it makes sense if if you're just looking for like a, a short-term plug and play sort of, uh, you know, I, I guess RB1, I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't want 1A, 1B, whatever you want to go with. I, I certainly think it makes a ton of sense for the Falcons to add another running back just because when you look at Algier's success last year, contrary to popular opinion, it wasn't like he carried the entire running game mm-hmm. for the Falcons. Like for the first half of the season, he was arguably their third best running back and it was Cordero Patterson and Caleb Huntley sort of outshining him. And then the second half of the season, he kind of went off and, but you still had contributions from Patterson and Huntley to a certain extent. So I think the Falcons do need to add another running back, whether they put a first round premium on it for B. John Robinson, I, I think certainly understand the skepticism there given some of their other issues. And so when you think about if I could get Derrick Henry and rent Derrick Henry for what a year or two and, and do it for a third round pick, you know, I think you could justify that value. I would probably lean to just getting another set of young legs in the in the room just because mm-hmm. you already have Cordero Patterson who's getting up there in years. You got Huntley coming off an Achilles injury. Um, so I feel like if if I want to use a third round pick, I would want someone who's 22 or mm-hmm. closer to 22 than he is to 32. I don't know exactly how old Derrick Henry is. He seems like he's been in the league forever. But he's probably, he can't be 30. He's 28. He's like 28, I think. I think. He's 28, so, 27, yeah, but something like it, that. It just yeah. feels like, you know, he's mm-hmm. in running back years. You yeah, know he's how 37. He, yeah, he's like 37 in, in running back years. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at with that. But, you know, no one's going to be upset watching Derrick Henry run over people. Also, Derrick Henry, Cordero Patterson, and Tyler Algier running over people. Like, that triumvirate, like, 
you talk about like just pain because like the way the Niners built their team last year was just that like we're going to out physical everybody whether it's Debo CMC uh, we still use the fullback like all of our dudes can run the football and we're just going to hurt you and better in our physicality because part of that bet on physicality I think in the league is that tackling is bad and tackling is continually going to get worse so when you have a bunch of dudes that are hard to tackle that is a an advantage that I think a lot of folks might overlook, and I think the Falcons uh, have done a good job uh, emphasizing that. When you don't have those skill position guys who just get open on their own and can flash, like not everyone can play like Patrick Mahomes in the Chiefs play. Like that's not a possibility for for the Falcons to win football games. But them betting on Tyler Algier being a pain in the butt to tackle Cordell Patterson running like a freaking freight train out of the backfield is super nice because a lot of folks just don't want to tackle and they don't want to go through those body blows as their body blows and it's uh i don't know i would just like to see henry algier and cordero and just get an interview in-game interviews with the defenders where it's like hey uh so how's it going out there you enjoying this experience are you enjoying 13 straight carries of cordero and derrick henry running through the gap and I just, I don't think it'd be fun. I think the Falcons identity is already leaning in that direction. Let's just go all the way out. Let's just make this the most physical running back room we've ever seen. That's what I would do. Fair. It's fair. I, I, you sold me. There you go. I, I I didn't even think I could do that, but there you go. Um, which positions are you certain Terry Fontenot hits on the draft? Like you're certain that these, these positions based on what he did in free agency is going to be hit in the draft. I think the two positions that I would point to are cornerback and, and edge rusher. Hmm. Um, I, I feel like, you know, going into the offseason, I thought the team would probably move on from Casey Hayward because mm -hmm. they wanted to get younger at that position. Ste till, still, technically, they could do that because last year they did wind up moving on from a couple of players after the draft, like Mike Davis probably be the most prominent one after they drafted Tyler Ajir. Um so I guess that's still technically a possibility, but it does feel like the team almost certainly has to find a young cornerback that they can sort of groom because Hayward's entering a contract here. He's going to be, I think, 33 or 34 this year. So having an option in-house that can sort of at least sit a year and then take over for him a year from now, to me, it, it, it's got to be a, a must-have for this team because I just don't think players like Darren Hall – and the newly acquired Mike Hughes are, are really good bets in that regard. Like they give you an insurance policy in the event that you draft that player and he doesn't work out, but that can't be necessarily your plan a at that position. And then with edge rusher, getting Calais Campbell, re-signing Lorenzo Carter, I think gives you a solid veteran presence, but neither one of those guys are long-term solutions. Campbell signed a one-year contract. Carter's on a two-year deal. Um, and, we kind of know that the team wants to have a, a little bit more beef up front when it comes to playing a little bit more four, three than the three, four sort of hybrid defense that they played last year. And so I, I feel like you got to get somebody in the building that again, you can kind of pencil in maybe sits this year or is part of the rotation uh, because, you know, you can get guys in and out of lineup on the D line, but sits, you know, b behind Calais Campbell and, and sort of is groomed behind them. And I think, Beyond those two positions, there's certainly a lot of other positions they can go, but I think a lot of that will kind of depend on how the board falls, like offensive line. It'll depend on, you know, if they get that guy wide receiver, I, I do think they'll probably draft a wide receiver, but at what point is that more of a depth guy or is that more of a, a potential starter? You know, would like to see them get a running back, but I don't think that's guaranteed. Um, linebacker, safety depth, or other positions they could wind up addressing, but I don't know if those are going to be the priority. So I, I look at edge and corner as two positions – that I feel like 100% the Falcons have to address every other position, maybe somewhere between like 50% and like 80% a likelihood of them addressing the draft. Your free agency grade for the Falcons. What is the, what's the letter grade you gave them? Um, I give them probably like a B, hmm. right? You know, and there's been some criticism over the last couple of weeks that the Falcons overpaid for, for some players, you know, maybe put too much money in non-premium positions with, a safety in Jesse Bates, David Onyemata, D tackle, Kay Nellis, a linebacker, uh, Calais Campbell, an, an older defensive end, adding a tight end like John O. Smith and whatnot, paying Chris Lindstrom a guard, the highest paid salary for that position. So a lot of people are, are questioning the Falcons spending a little bit, but, um, you know, I, I think those criticisms are fair, but they don't necessarily deter me because I think, you know, 
solidifying your foundation, you know, kind of the spine of your defense up the middle, as well as your offensive line make total sense, given how the style that we've just been discussing with the Falcons wanting to be a physical football team. So spending money there makes total sense. And I, I feel like the Falcons really did a good job raising their floor on the defensive side of the ball with players like Anyamata, Bates, Caden Ellis, Calais Campbell. You're going to have potentially probably the best pass rush we've seen in Atlanta in like 20 years it's been 20. hold on don't jinx it you can't do this aaron you cannot do this you mean this you cannot say it's gonna be one of the best we cannot do this yet i until i see it we are not doing this i i can't allow it my sanity cannot take it no can't do it well the bar is so low when it comes to a, a, yes. a competent falcons pass rush so i don't feel like i'm jinxing it when i say that but certainly you know it's been 20 almost 20 years since they've had 40 plus sacks and so Whew. you know Fingers crossed that they can reach a number that 40 sacks is league average nowadays. Mm. So that's that's how long it's been since the Falcons had a competent pass rush. So I'm hopeful for that. And for that reason alone, that hope, that optimism that they give me that, hey, the Falcons will have a competent league average pass rush <laughs> for the first time in 20 years, mm. you know, elevates it to a B. Um, but I think, you know, some of the other areas where I would like to have seen them, you know, maybe invest a little bit more resources is what prevents it from being an A and, and maybe you can ding a little bit for, you know, spending a little bit more money at, at some non-premium positions than uh, maybe some people would prefer. Uh, on Locked on Falcons of late, you've been uh, adamant about Desmond Ritter. It's like, this is Desmond Ritter's show and this is like, this is the way to go. And like, we're building and like, just he deserves the opportunity to get the full on chance. And like, we don't need to get into the Lamar things. I just don't think uh, that's happening. I think that ship sailed. Um, shout out to also miles Garrett. who's fighting the good fight every day on twitter.com over the Lamar Jackson uh, Falcons connections. However, I will still say, and I've said this all off season that I was like, it wasn't Lamar that I was just like, I had circled of who the Falcons, if they were ever to entertain it, it was not Lamar Jackson. It was Trey Lance where if that they made the point where it's like Brock Purdy doesn't get hurt at the end of last year. I think Trey Lance is already on the market. Like, I think that's just like a public knowledge that, hey, the 49ers are shopping Trey Lance. I still, in my heart of hearts, believe that Terry Fonda would have taken Trey Lance if the, if the 49ers had not usurped them in the, in the draft to trade up. We haven't seen anything out of him. The man has barely played football in three years. That is one where I'm like, oh. If Brock Purdy is the guy and the way they've been talking this week, it seems like it's still going to be Brock Purdy when he comes back with his robotic arm. I mean, could you see it based on where his value is at the moment? Because that's an important part where his value, I think, is dinged a lot right now. And there's a lot of questions about him. He hasn't played football in forever. I don't think the Niners have a lot of leverage there if they wanted to move him at this point because a lot of them are like, a lot of folks around the league are like, mm, you don't have Jimmy Garoppolo anymore. Like, you have Brock Purdy. Are you really going to go into this fall just saying we're going back and forth and you're not going to name it? Are you really certain you want to deal with that drama this? Or do you want to get out of this and just say this is Brock's team? I, I'm i okay with that idea. Like, I want Tyson Ritter to be QB1, but if you were to tell me that Trey Lance was available and an option especially for the kind of offense the Falcons are running. He's a lot younger than Lamar. He obviously flashed a lot in that one year at North Dakota State. I could see it all working. I could see a scenario where you take a flyer on him. Like, that's my only one who I'm looking around where I'm like, if you don't want Desmond Ritter this fall, or even just bring in someone to compete with, because I think it would still be a competition to bring in uh, a Trey Lance to compete with Desmond Ritter. Could you see it? And do you think it's realistic that Trey Lance could be a Falcon this year? This year, no, right? Okay. I think for the reasons that you, you pointed out, but <clears throat> there was a point certainly in January before Brock Purdy's injury mm. where I was like, you know, there were various reports. I think Mike Silver had like, they would give him up for like a third round pick or something like that. Mm. And I'm like, that feels too enticing for the, all the reasons that you just pointed out. But then I think Purdy got hurt like the next day or something like that it, mm. when, they, when they played. And all of a sudden that kind of threw that out the window. Um, yeah, I, I think Lance is certainly a player that can be circled for uh, as a possibility for the Falcons, probably not between now and the start of the season. Um, for the, all the reasons that you mentioned, like it doesn't feel like San Francisco's going to be too enthusiastic about shopping him, especially for that type of price. Like you feel like 
you know, given the question marks surrounding Purdy, you want to have that insurance policy in the back pocket. And, you know, I know Kyle Shanahan, you know, has a lot of confidence and maybe ego about what he can do, but I, I can't really believe that he's going to go fully in on the Sam Darnold train as this sort of their insurance policy in San Francisco. So I think Lance is really a player that you kind of put in your back pocket for if you're the Falcons and you give Ritter this year, see what he does. And, you know, you potentially, hopefully, maybe you get to see a little bit more trailers because at this point in time, him and Ritter have a very similar re- resume, only four starts in their career. Uh, very different college resume, though. Yeah. Desmond Ritter, I think, is the all-time winning this quarterback in college, I think. He's either right there. He's either one or two. He, uh, he's up there, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's that's kind of the issue. The one question mark I would have for Trey Lance, um, I liked Trey Lance when he, when he came out, but I didn't rate him as a top three pick type of, mm. of quarterback. And, you know, you have the athletic tools, but the big question with Trey Lance was kind of the accuracy. Mm. Um and it's a similar dynamic with Desmond Ritter, where it, it just feels like they're similar types of quarterbacks, although you would probably argue just from a runner or arm strength standpoint, Trey Lance has that boost. But I think you you kind of want to see if you're the Atlanta Falcons, you want to see a little bit more of a body of work from Trey Lance before you're willing to go from, you know, Desmond Ritter, who has, you know, good athleticism, a, a pretty strong arm. Uh, and the one question about him coming out was his accuracy to another quarterback that has those same concerns with Trey Lance, but just might have better physical tools, uh, but maybe a little bit less experience. And, and maybe you're not as sold on him as a decision maker at this point in time based off of his limited body of work. So it, it's it's kind of a dance. I, I, I could certainly see in a world where Desmond Ritter kind of struggles this season and the Falcons are looking to make a, a change, bringing in someone like a Trey Lance after this season makes a ton of sense. Um, you know, maybe there's a possibility of a midseason trade or something like that uh, that could also make sense. But I think between now and the start of the season, it's very unlikely to see that type of move. All that being said, when you look at the NFC South, Aaron, I feel like there's no way to say other than the Falcons are the favorite. I think uh, Arthur Smith doesn't want that to be said out loud where it's like uh, I don't want that because if Arthur Blank starts reading Falcons are the favorite those pieces coming out uh, then it's like uh oh then you're underachieving if you only win eight or nine games and come in second and barely get a wild card uh, next year but I look around this division I think the Bucks are going to be terrible I think the Saints are just fighting their hardest to avoid uh, a painful rebuild but I don't think they're going to be there the Panthers are probably going to be starting a rookie quarterback for the majority of the year. I don't see a scenario where the Falcons don't play their first home playoff game uh, ever at Mercedes-Benz, which is crazy to say out loud, but still very much the case. Are you there? Should the Falcons be considered the favorites going into next year? I'm not quite there yet at this point, um, but I, like, I'm not going to push back on that, you know? Mm-hmm. Like in my heart, like that's what I want to believe, but mm. it's just we're join not me, a- Aaron. Join me. <laughs> we're not at a the point. Kings in the of the crap, because feel, like this division is terrible. I yeah, just, I, I feel I don't feel like I feel like all of these teams are kind of clustered together, and it's yeah. just going to be like who you know who plays well. Oh, wow, what a profound statement. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that the teams that score more and give up less. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I think that's the, probably the key to success. But, like, you know, there's a lot of question marks with all these teams, right? And so that's more the point I'm trying to make where it's just like, who who answers those questions in terms of, you know, Desmond Ridge is probably the biggest question mark about the Falcons. And, you you know, I sit here with Do you think Des is the biggest question? I think for most people, most people look at the Falcons and say, okay, hmm. we know they can run the ball. We think the offensive line is good, right? Based off mm. of how they finished last year. We feel like the defense now is going to be, again, competent, not good, but competent. You know, I, I was going to say, I think it's the defense. I think it's the pass rush. Like, that's the one. If the pass rush is good, like, that's a game changer for the Falcons upside this year. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But as as you, we just discussed, like I I I'm very optimistic about the pass rush at this point. I know, so. and it scares me. I I like it, Aaron, but it also terrifies me. I just I'm not worried about quarterback. It's like the opposite. Like I'm a Tennessee guy, and look, I know your Pitt Panthers had to suffer at the hands of Cedric Tillman and company to open last year, but like it. you look at it in the opposite. It's like I'm not worried about Joe Milton and Hooker, Nico. Like it's Hypo's gonna have good offenses. Like it's just year over year. I am not concerned Arthur Smith is not going to find a way to win a lot of football games without elite quarterback play. Like I just, I think the floor is high because he doesn't 
put these guys in situations where they have to do everything. And I think whether it's Desmond Ritter, Taylor Heineke, whoever, the see the floor is so much higher. I'm concerned about the ceiling and like how much they open up there. But like, I don't know. I'm just not worried about quarterback. Like, I'm not worried about Desmond Ritter being terrible. I don't think there's a path for that. I think the path for Desmond Ritter is like he's our Alex Smith, where he's just super efficient, wins a lot of regular season games, doesn't take a bunch of chances, wins a lot. But then we're all like four years from now, we're like, all right, this was this was fun, but like we need to get to that next guy the game changer guy and it's probably not him i i just see him as the alex smith long-term bridge uh bridge guy uh, that's fair that's that's probably similar to how i i sort of see him but mm. you know i think a lot of people question whether that that's the type of quarterback that the falcons have which is what we're talking about where yeah you know that's why people are looking at trey lance and and, and lamar jackson already so that that's kind of where i'm coming from with him being kind of the biggest question where it's like okay we got we got our alex smith but now we got to go get our patrick mahomes right and everybody's mm-hmm. wondering who's that next guy and so yeah i, I think that's fair so yeah there you go uh who was the guy you you had on the podcast uh, about a month or two ago about the cfl corner who was that um when jamal y'all... peters yes um, i think who the guest was um i'm sorry i'm blanking on that guy's name well is he still on the roster or no yeah he's still here okay uh because that was exciting i was reading through that i'm like oh that's that's a cool story i hope he makes it because he's uh yeah that uh, just the corner situation too like i just aj terrell is fighting for his life uh on an island by himself and he's just looking around like can someone can someone in casey hayward's like hey, look i've got to go to i think he's from perry georgia right so i think he he's from where the uh the national fair is uh in, over there in perry georgia where like that's what they're known for is the big fair so maybe he's got plans like what is he going to be doing this fall because that's fall season like you cannot count on casey hayward to uh be there all season long when you have something like that in perry georgia but i don't know i my hope is eighth they go corner trade for derrick henry in week six <laughs> trade for trey lance this spring <laughs> And then win the NFC South and be really exciting and fun. I think that's all very, very realistic and very doable, Aaron. I, I don't see why not. Okay. All right. You said it, so I, I'll buy in 100%. Can you imagine how much Atlanta's rocking with Trey Lance, Derrick Henry, Cordell Patterson, Drake London, Kyle Pitts? It's fun. That is fun. Look, you're not going to get complaints from me on that. I, I'll, I'm going to enjoy watching it. Uh, yeah. Watching Derrick Henry play football on Sundays is, you know. It's a fun thing to do. It really is. Yeah. Aaron, what can the good folks check out from you and the team over at Locked On Falcons this week? Yeah, we're we're in draft season, so we're talking, you know, who the Falcons are going to take in round one. Mm. At some point in the near future, we'll be talking about the quarterbacks, not necessarily as Falcon players, but, you know, one of these guys is going to wind up in Carolina, and we're going to see a lot of them. So, mm. you know, it's a good idea to try to, you know, get some insight into th- these guys. So you can check that out. Uh, in the next couple of days on Lockdown Falcons. And of course, Lockdown Falcons free available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There you go. Right to hell for Carolina too with getting rid of the silver in their uniforms that the new uniforms are not going to have silver around the league. Like the Texans obvious, but like the Panthers never needed to have new uniforms. They've been perfect forever. Getting rid of the silver. What are we doing? You're in North Carolina, Aaron. Like they just go over there and be like, Hey, Tepper, I understand you want to change stuff, but like, what are we doing? You came from the Steelers model where it's like they don't change anything because when it's actually good, don't mess with it. I am terrified about what the Panthers are going to look like after this. And it it bothers me. I saw the silver. It ruined my day. Like I was just like unwell. Which is walking. Around. I'm looking at the I have all the NFL helmets right here and I'm looking at the silver. I'm looking at the Panthers logo. It's a great logo right next to the Falcons. What are we doing? What are we doing, Aaron? Look, I think this is what we see from NFL owners mm-hmm. where they come in, they want to change the unit, they want to put their stamp, but that first set of uniforms is, is usually not the best, right? Because mm-hmm. my personal opinion, and I'm, I'm curious if you disagree when the Falcons changed their uniform, when Arthur Blank took over in the early two mm-hmm. thousands, I wasn't a big fan of those uniforms. No. And so like, I feel like you got to get the the bad set out and then like, okay, well, we're still know. working on that. Cause he hasn't gotten fully out of it. I mean, we were doing gradient this la- most recent cycle. So we're still not there. <laughs> I like the gradients, but I, I understand why people are not big fans of it. So um, it also doesn't help when you already have good uniforms, like you already have them in the past. And I understand like the weird things about helmets and all that stuff, but like even the Michael Vick era with the black on silver, that was great. Like the red with the gold trim, also great. Like we have all of these examples of great uniforms that fans actually prefer. And you're like, what if we made it weirder? 
what if we added some really crazy gradients? What if we made this look more like a seven-year-old on TikTok designed our uniforms? What if we lean more into making sure no one bought our jerseys? Uh, and just because, like, I can't walk around in a Kyle Pitts gradient Falcons jersey around Knoxville. I'm going to get clowned, and rightfully so. Like, I, that's a, it's a rough look for any adult man. It's already hard enough wearing jerseys as adults, Aaron. Like, I can't be rocking gradient. Look, that's 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 what... I don't have a hairline, and I'm rocking gradient jerseys? Like, that's, that's over. What, that's what the world is telling you, man. You're, you're yeah. an adult man. You, you can't just be wearing jerseys out in the wild on a random Wednesday. In no, Nashville. it's a tough look. It's a tough look. Um, yeah, it's... But, hey, game day, jerseys are fine. Game yes. days are jerseys are fine. They are the official uniform of a fan, right? Yeah. There you go. You get the play act as a as a part of the team, right? I'm I'm basically part of the team, and the Falcons <laughs> have put me through hell the last couple of years. So, it, and I'm fighting for my life to care about this team that's rebuilding and not doing anything. Like I'm telling you, like I've had some sad Sunday afternoons at the sports bar, uh, taking notes, watching the Falcons, where they're like, "What are you doing?" And I'm just like my club soda and lime, just jotting down. Oh, take one, Graham. Oh, and then they're just like, "Oh my God, that Chargers Falcons was terrible." And I'm like, "Yeah, that was a that was a terrible use of my three and a half hours. That was terrible." And uh, yeah, there you go. That's the Falcons. Just be good again. Be fun. Can yeah. can we be can we be fun next year? That's all I want. Trey Lance, Derek Henry, make it fun. Aaron Freeman, thank you as always. Go subscribe. Locked On Falcons YouTube podcast, wherever your podcast, all that good stuff he does. Fantastic work covering the Atlanta Falcons and you uh, keep up the great work, sir. And uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. Appreciate it. Well done, nephew. Chase Thomas podcast. Hell yeah.